I've heard better trumpet fanfares. <laughs> I realize it's a little almost sacrilegious to try and sing after a beautiful solo like that. But if we all try together, maybe we can make a joyful noise. More about Jesus, please. More about Jesus I would know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. Of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. I think I missed it by a mile last night. I understand that uh, there are some 7.30 classes I've double-checked, and I'm aiming for 7.25 this evening, okay? I'd like to begin with a uh, parable that a friend of mine wrote and sent me, which later showed up in a magazine that some people consider contraband and underground. Uh, I don't care. I still like the parable. And I'd like to have you consider it as sort of a midpoint of our discussion on salvation. This story begins and ends in Mercy Hospital, in the intensive care ward. The patient's name is Ben Trine. He'd been trying to be a Christian. He'd been trying to be good. He'd been trying to believe, to have faith, to break through. But it seemed useless, hopeless. And now he lay flat on his back with but a few brief hours to live. To him, time was very precious. He knew that he was breathing on borrowed time. He had no one to help him prepare for eternity except his three religious sisters. Each were professed Christians. Each had come to comfort and console their dear brother in this tragic moment of crisis and grief. Maybe they could help him break through and believe before it was too late. Even now they waited in the lobby of the intensive care ward to see their dying brother. The nurse whispered to one of the sisters, Miss Nebulous N. Tangible. She quietly followed and was told that she had three minutes. As she sat by the bedside of her despairing dear brother and looked into his eyes, she knew that he was without God and without hope. He clutched her hand and moaned, Please, sis, help me to break through. I don't have much time. Help me. How could he be helped? What could she say? She took a deep breath and began to speak. Ben, Ben, listen to me. You must give your heart to Jesus quickly. Ben stared at her in disbelief. He moved his hand over his heart and looked puzzled. You must reach out your hand and take his. You must behold the lamb. You must fall on the rock. You must surrender all. Ben's expression conveyed confusion, so she continued. You must rely on his merits. You must put on his unconquerable robe of righteousness. You must wear his wedding garment. It is yours, Ben. Beads of sweat rolled off his tired, worn face. His head lay back on the pillow as he stared hopelessly at the ceiling. A mournful sigh escaped his lips as he trembled in despair. The nurse came in and whispered, Miss Nebulous, your time is up. The second sister, Miss Solid Ann Concrete, made her way into her brother's room and sat at his bedside. Before she could say anything, Ben looked frantically at her and with great effort forced out these words. Oh, sis, please help me. I'm trying to break through, but I can't. I can't. 
She leaned over and looked into his face. It portrayed the anxiousness of his heart. She then took his trembling hand and said, Ben, I can only tell you what the Bible says about the kind of people that will go to heaven. Their behavior will be in distinct contrast to that of the world. If you want to be there, well, it's up to you. But in order for you to have hope and in order for you to be a Christian, you must first renounce your old life of sin, your life of wickedness and selfishness, your social habits, your behavior, your conversation must be drastically changed. Everything you do has got to go. It's evil. It's no good. I have to tell you the truth, Ben. You must give up your gambling. Stop smoking. Stop drinking. Quit going to those terrible bars and nightclubs. Change your habit patterns. Don't associate with your old friends. Make new ones. Lose all that weight. Quit being a glutton. Make your body a fit place for the Lord to dwell. Allow only good and uplifting and nobling thoughts to enter your mind. Stop reading those vile magazines and stories. Read the Bible. Fill your mind with things that are pure and lovely. Dwell on things in heaven. Love the Lord and hate evil with a perfect hatred. And Ben, Ben, are you listening? She called for the nurse. Ben was gasping for breath. He choked and gagged. The nurse quickly took his pulse. He's almost gone. Could you wait outside, please? Moments later, the nurse beckoned to the last sister. Are you Ben's other sister, she asked. Yes, I am. You don't have much time, the nurse said, and neither does he. I understand. Thank you very much. Sitting beside her precious brother, Miss Faith in Christ, took his hand and prayed silently that her words would be life to poor Ben, her wandering, lost baby brother. She looked into his eyes with hope and courage and said, Ben, are you ready to die? No, sis, I'm not. But I'm trying to believe, sis. He wrung his hands and he wept as he sighed and shook his head, but it's no use, I can't. I've tried as hard as I can, but it's no use. Faith leaned toward his sister, toward his ear, rather, as he lay there motionless. My dear brother Ben, I understand your predicament. Would you just be still for a few minutes, just be very quiet, and listen? That's all I ask. As soon as he was calm, Faith began to speak. She did not urge him to try harder to believe, but instead she gave him the assurance of how God the Father had loved him already in Jesus Christ. She began to tell him the good news. She said, Ben, while you were his enemy, the Father loved you and chose you to be with him where he is. He spared not his only son for you. All of heaven was emptied for you. God has given all the accumulated and hoarded love and wealth of eternity in the gift of Jesus. You have been redeemed, forgiven, and accepted in Jesus. Two thousand years ago, God the Son, your Savior, Jesus, left heaven because all of its stupendous glory was not a place to be desired while you were lost. He whom angels loved and worshipped stepped down from his exalted throne to come to this dark planet Earth, and at heaven's appointed hour he was born in a lowly stable for you. He grew up then and lived and suffered shame and humiliation as the rejected one in order that you might be the accepted one. For your sake he became poor that through his poverty you might be rich. He was treated the way you deserve that you might be treated the way he deserves. He wore the crown of thorns that you might wear the crown of life. He died for you. And now he offers to take your sins and give you his righteousness. If you accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you had never sinned. Ben's ear had heard the everlasting gospel. Faith was kindled in his heart. He saw through the illumination of the Holy Spirit that he was accepted because Jesus is acceptable. 
He saw that he was pleasing in God's sight because Jesus is altogether pleasing. He grasped the simple truth that Jesus was his personal representative and substitute at the Father's right hand. He realized now that the question was not, will God accept me? But in the light of the gospel, will I accept the fact that I've already been accepted? He comprehended the amazing discovery that the very fact that he was a sinner entitled him to come to Jesus. There was no question now. The Holy Spirit did his work, and little by little, the chain of evidence was linked together. In Jesus, bruised, mocked, and hanging upon the cross, he saw the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Hope flooded his soul. He had the assurance and the confidence and the boldness that Jesus' life was his life. Gratitude swelled in his heart for Jesus. Tears rolled down his cheeks. Joy filled his soul. Melted and subdued, a smile broke upon his face as he said, I see it. I see it. It was for me. I accept it. I believe. I like it. Do you like it? Have you realized, my friend, that long before you ever looked in heaven's direction, Jesus had already accepted you. And all you have to do is to accept his acceptance. You mean it's that simple? Yes. But the strange thing is that so many of us don't find it interesting or vital until we are in similar circumstances to poor Ben. I remember trying hard at Laurelwood Academy in the Northwest to talk to the kids in the classes I was teaching while pastoring at the same time about the good news of the gospel. And I remember trying hard day after day until the, the end of the year, and then I guess some of the kids felt sorry for me. And they came past the uh, desk after class one day, just before school was out. And they said, hey, uh, Teach, we just wanted to tell you that we understand what you're saying. And if we ever need it, we'll remember. Ouch. And if we ever need it, we'll remember. I'll guarantee you that in the law of averages, there are some of you here that will go that route, and it won't look interesting to you, and you won't really feel the need of it until the ulcers and the sleepless nights and the potential suicide. But whether you accept it early or late, don't forget that you've already been accepted in Jesus. At the cross, Jesus made the provision for the salvation of every person, and that includes you. Oh, someone says, I don't care. I'm not that interested. I have my life to live, and uh, I'll join the rest of the world. After you've lived your threescore years and ten, you die and you're dead for a long time. I don't care what happens to me when I'm 70, but no one says that when they're 68. And the favorite question 
that I got from my dad that I still like to ask people. Would you like to live life over again? Still haunts me when I think of the answers. The older a person is, and the more he's seen of this life, the quicker he says, no thanks. If I would have to live my life over again exactly as I've lived it, with all of the joys and all of the sorrows, and all of the ups and all of the downs, just the same, no thanks. Which, if that's true, then the only conclusion is that this life is worth something during its threescore years and ten, only in terms of accepting the great plan of forever and helping someone else to accept it too. Now I'd like to focus your attention for a few minutes on 1 Corinthians 1.30, which uh, gives us a bridge from justification into sanctification and then into glorification when Jesus comes. You recall, as we started, that salvation consists of at least three parts. Being saved from the guilt of sin, that's what happens when you get with Christ. Being saved from the power of sin, that's what happens as you stay with Christ. And being saved from a world of sin, that's what happens when you go with Christ at his second coming. Three aspects of salvation. First one the theologians call justification, the second one sanctification, and the third one glorification. And it's interesting how they show up in this single text. First Corinthians 1.30, But of him, that is of God, are ye in Christ Jesus, what, is, what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Well, you know, it's something similar to he that hath the Son hath life, 1 John 5, 11 and 12. To have the Son means to have a relationship with him. And when you are in Christ, you are in relationship with him. The initial step when you first accept him is the beginning and the continuing abiding relationship is what follows. All right? In Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us four things, wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Four things. Now, in Paul's writings, the word righteousness is translated from the same root word that justification comes from. So in a sense, in this verse, you have that Jesus is made unto us justification and sanctification and glorification because redemption includes the whole business down to the ultimate finish of restoration to our original state. So let's read it that way. Of God we are in Christ Jesus, who has made unto us wisdom and justification and sanctification and glorification. Now I'm thankful right to begin with that Jesus is made unto us wisdom to understand this. The devil is a master mind. He has no willpower. Because we're told that the essence of uh, godliness is self-control or results in self-control. And that the highest evidence of nobility in the Christian is self-control. If that's true, then the lowest evidence of the opposite of nobility 
or degradation and scum would be lack of self-control. And for that reason, I'm quite convinced that the devil, even though he may be smart, is rather weak. In fact, if he is the devil and all he's supposed to be, he would be the weakest. He has no self-control. And I know that's true in my own life because if the devil had been smart, he would have left me alone a long time ago when he had me. At one time, I was fooled into thinking I was a Christian because I was a good liver. And if the devil had had any sense at all, or willpower, he would have said, good, let's keep him that way. But instead, he had to keep needling me until he drove me to my knees. That shows how stupid he is. But he's still a mastermind, and he's done everything he can to keep people from understanding God correctly and Jesus. And he does everything he can to keep people from understanding the whole theme of salvation and righteousness by faith. I remember talking in one parish for 18 months every Wednesday night where we made a special point to talk about this tremendous theme. And for 18 months, we were going over the same thing in different ways, different directions. And one night, there was a lady in the back of the room who jumped out of her seat right in the middle of our midweek meeting as though she had sat on a pin or something. And I saw it. When the meeting was over, she came practically running down the aisle. And she said, you know, I, I understood something tonight. That you, Why didn't you tell us this before? And I said, we've been saying it for 18 months. My boy, who is 23 now, was in the academy. We were worried about him because he hadn't really found a meaningful relationship with Jesus yet. And uh, all we could do is pray. One night they invited him down, some of the other kids, to the um, Bible teacher's house for a discussion. He went down to ask some hard questions. He liked to ask hard questions. But there were some other kids there who were praying for him. And after he'd been asking his hard questions for a little while, something said to him, why don't you shut up then, you might learn something. So he began to listen, and before the evening was over, he had heard something that he had never heard before, but he had sure heard it before. Have you ever heard something that you'd heard before, but you never heard before? You know what it was? You don't change your life in order to come to Christ. You come to Christ just as you are. And he loves to accept you just as you are. He had never heard that before. But he had sure heard that before. And he came home, he was so excited, he came to me and said, Dad, listen, have, have you heard this before? And he began to tell me and to try and convince me that you never change your life in order to come to Christ. You come to Christ just as you are. And I didn't want to ruin it for him, so I said, really? Is that right? Tell me some more. And he was ecstatic. Jesus had become his wisdom that night. And he was an evangelist overnight. That next Friday evening, he had a whole bunch of kids from the school up at our house to try and get that same message across to them. The mother and I were in the back room lying on the floor listening under the crack in the door. We didn't want to ruin it for them. 
And it was the same thing they were trying to get across again. Listen, get it, don't forget it. You don't change in order to come to Christ. If you think you're going to do that, you'll never get there. You come just as you are. That seems to be a hard point to get through the human skull. And the devil has made it hard. But what good news it is. It takes Jesus to bring wisdom for us to even understand that. It doesn't say that Jesus gives us wisdom. Jesus is wisdom. It's just like righteousness or the Cadillac Seville. You don't have his wisdom any longer than you have him. When you have him, you have his wisdom. You don't have his righteousness any longer than you have him. When you have him, you have his righteousness. So he is our wisdom and justification. It is in him that we are declared righteous and stand before God as though we had never sinned. And it's all because of the cross. And it's him, in him, that we are made righteous in sanctification. And it's in him that we will travel from earth to glory when he comes again. Now let's look at these three for just a moment. Is there anyone here who thinks, if you know the slightest thing about the gospel, that you can add anything to what was done at the cross? Is it justification by faith plus works? Is it justification by faith plus anything? If you know the slightest thing about the plan of salvation, I don't think anyone would take the position that we can add anything to the finished work at the cross. It's by faith alone. Now let's skip the middle one and go to the third one. Glorification. When Jesus comes again, is there anyone here who is deluded enough to think that you're going to be able to travel from earth to heaven by faith plus works? By faith plus effort? Have you ever been in a speedboat going across the lake, 100 horsepower Merc behind? And you say, uh, we're going too slow, you know? 50 miles an hour, too slow. You take out an oar, begin trying to row. Have you ever been in a 747 going from San Francisco to Boston? And you say, this thing's never going to make it. You open the door and begin trying to help things along. Something weird is going to happen to you. It doesn't make sense. Does God have enough power to get you from earth to heaven? Are you going to be able to help him out? Will it be glorification changed from uh, mortal to immortal and transported 105 trillion miles and more by faith plus your efforts? No, there's nobody that deluded. But when you get to the middle one, sanctification, living the Christian life, Growing up into Christ, most of us, at one time or another, if not right now, believe that it all happens by faith plus working hard at it. Faith plus gritting your teeth and slugging it out with the devil. Faith plus works. And the only thing I want you to catch tonight, and this is heavy duty truth is this text puts them all together in one lump. Justification, sanctification, glorification are all by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And some of the heaviest misunderstandings have been in the area of sanctification where we will begin tomorrow. 
thinking that we are saved from the power of sin by belief in Jesus plus working hard at it ourselves. You mean to tell me, preacher, that sanctification is by faith alone too? Yes. And the reason that some of us have had a hard time accepting justification by faith is because we've been so mixed up and worn out trying to live the sanctified life that we couldn't even believe that. We've been so busy trying to make the monthly payments that we couldn't even believe that the down payment was free. Let alone the monthly payments free too. I've got good news for you. Jesus is all of it. And I wish you'd pray as we continue this week that he will bring wisdom to every heart, every mind, to see it. What a wonderful redemption. Never can a mortal know how my sins, though red like crimson, can be whiter than the snow. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you this evening for your wonderful love a love that will not let us go. And we thank you that you've followed each one here every day of their life. And we're thankful tonight that the open arms of Jesus are still there, inviting us to come and to have rest. Please help us as we continue to seek you and to understand the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen.